So welcome everybody and thank you for attending this session. So as you guys know, that we had a pretty, um, some pretty cool presentations this, uh, this morning on training. And so I'm going to kind of continue on the same theme, except I want to concentrate more on um, surgical training and um, also talk about assessment um, and then also talk about the results what we can obtain from it. So addressing animal welfare and confounding back factors. So within next 45 minutes to 50 minutes, we'll talk about conventional training um, or also refer as traditional training. We're going to talk about refined training. So this is something that we have brought on from um, the human surgical training side to uh, the veterinary slash laboratory animal side. We're going to talk about the phases that are part of the training. And we're going to also give you some information regarding the studies uh, that we have performed uh, addressing this type of training. And then we're going to spend probably about uh, 20 minutes or so talking about competency assessment. And also supposed to remind you that at the end of the session, we're going to have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, we'll, I'll be more than happy to address those uh, at that time. So before we move forward, um, I would like to kind of get to know you guys a little bit more. Um, so here's a little poll. Um, if you could take a couple seconds to answer that, Paul, please. So does your institution offer rodent surgical training? Great, so still having some folks responding. Great, so it's about 50-50. So also, does your institution require surgical training prior to performing rodent surgery? So meaning the people must take training before they're actually approved to perform those rodent procedures at your facility. And again, I'm going to give you, you know, 10, 15 seconds to answer this, this poll. So here we see it's about 70 yes and uh, 30 no. So we have two more questions for you guys. So why do you perform rodent surgery? So 40% of you guys do and 60% of you guys don't. That's pretty cool. And the last question is, do PIs perform rodent surgery at your institution? So we're not talking about the core, surgical core that does that, but actual PIs. So these answers were also kind of allow me to gauge a little bit some of the information and how to present it to you guys. Um, so we're not wasting um, your time. 
So the question from my own is with the PI, so it's principal investigators. I apologize, should I clarify that? So scientists. So it's 60 yes and 40% no, great. So I'm gonna talk about, about surgical training. Just close that poll there. So it's coming up again. So we're going to talk about gastric bypass surgeries in mice and rats when we address these different training um, phases. And the reason for that is because that's one of the most common procedure that we have taught within last four years or so uh, in mice as well as in rats. But again, pretty much everything that we're going to talk about today, you're going to be able to translate into other uh, surgical procedures as well, pretty much in surgical training in general. So one of the things that at most of the facilities, we have by methodology, methodology training. And then we have also surgical training. And that's how we can also split, I guess, divide the procedures that we perform. We have methodologies or biomethodologies, kind of like doing IP injections, subcutaneous injections, moving animals from cage to cage. And then you have the surgical procedures. So when we're looking on the pain scale, um, the methodologies, the chances of them um, introducing pain uh, or suffering are kind of on the left hand side, on the lower side, when it's compared to surgical. So on surgery, when you're looking on um, the right side, the chances of actually causing pain is significantly higher. And when we did a non-scientific uh, survey, what we found that 99% of institutions provided and required methodology training. Meaning before you actually were able to handle rodents, you had to learn how to move the rodent from cage to cage, how to handle them. But when we ask about surgical training, um, that was significantly different. So 2% of institutions only required um, surgical training prior to performing rodent surgery. Um, and 9% um, of them actually provided the training. And again, this was about a year ago or so. But personally, since I've came into the laboratory animal field, which has been a little bit over 15 years now, I always find it amazing that almost every institution requires and provides biomethodology training, but not surgical training. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So the conventional training for surgery uh, here, and most especially when you're talking about scientists and PIs, um, the way that really works is that they'll read a paper and they'll try to perform those procedures. And people who perform those procedures do not have surgical background, um, you know, they're PhD students, they don't have a veterinary background or medical background. So they pretty much read the paper descriptions and then try it on live animals. And I know that's changing a little bit uh, within the last couple of years or so. So for us, the way we refined the training is that we split it into four phases. So you have phase one, and phase two, where you have the basic and advanced training, and that's performed on inanimate tools. So non-animals, non-animal tools. We don't use animals during those two phases. Then you have phase three, where you perform actual training utilizing the animals. And then you have phase four, where you address proficiency. And again, this is something that we're really translating from a human surgery side to the veterinary lab animal side.
And it has been validated and demonstrated that on the human surgery side, this type of training really does work. But then the question always comes up, is this gonna work in our, um, in our field? Um, and one of the other challenges is that on the human surgery side, you have you know, six, seven, eight years to learn surgical procedures. For us, you know, people wanna learn these procedures in a couple hours, half a day. Um, so when we looked at, can we find a model that's similar to that, it was really challenging. But when we moved to Wake Forest, here in North Carolina, they actually do training for the government. Uh, so for example, they train Navy SEALs, people who have no surgical background, no medical background, but they'll teach them, for example, how to amputate a limb when they're actually in the field. And that training takes about two to four weeks or so. Uh, so it's very condensed training um, and, and it does work. And they actually utilize these various non-animal tools uh, before they actually get into either using cadavers or animals. So using that model, um, which again has been validated, we're translating that into the lab animal side. So one of the things that we look at during when we introduce this type of training was confidence. So why do we care about confidence? Uh, well, a sur confident surgeon will perform their procedure faster and just more confidently. So the movements are different. Um, and it give you more confidence. So for example, you're not gonna have these jagged edges where you would have with potentially someone that's not confident. And when we compared, this is an, an N of 25, uh, when we compared the conventional, the tradi traditional training uh, to the refined training, uh, what we found out is that people are significantly more confident uh, with that training. Um, and again, I'll talk about a little bit more detail uh, why it makes that more of a difference. Then we also look at the comfort level. And again, this is, those are two things that are also being addressed on the human surgery side as well. Uh, so the comfort level, if a person is not stressed, they're not tense, um, they can relax and perform a procedure. So your muscles don't tire as quickly um, and it has an impact on the outcome of your procedure. So you don't fatigue as fast. And again, uh, here, what we found is that with the refined training, the comfort level is significantly higher than with the conventional, the traditional training. So now let's talk about the phase one. So this is the basic procedures, basic uh, training. And this phase includes things like using a microscope. How do you handle the instruments? How do you pick and handle your suture material? different knot tying techniques, uh, incision and suture techniques. And these all seem very, very basic. But what we found since we started doing hands-on workshops here at Wake Forest, that people who have been doing surgery for 10, 15, even 20 years, who consider themselves as experts, very often handle the instruments the wrong way. They don't tie the knots appropriately. And again, the reason for that is because very often they have learned from reading uh, papers, or they have learned, for example, from another scientist or another student. So something very basic, um, as you can see here, uh, they're talking about, for example, a looped or eyed needle. Uh, so this needle, when you're going to pull it through, the suture, because it's thicker, is going to actually, then the needle is going to end up tearing through the tissues. So the needles that you should use is the one on the right here, the non-eyed needle. But it's just shocking how many times we still see people using the eyed needles. And the reason is because they, don't, they have never been taught. They don't know that. So you know, how do we teach again? We talk about anonymous tools. So here you have my son. He's learning how to do an IM injection um, on what looks like a, dog, a cat, but it's actually a dog. And again, obviously, it's an alive animal. So here are some examples of what you can utilize for teaching basic suturing techniques. Um, so one um, on top here, you can see you have a straight line and you also have these marks where the suture should go. Then we switch to the curved incision. And again, you have the marks. And then we switch to something that has the marks and then it does not. And it's really important that the sutures are placed 
at the same distance from the incision and in between the sutures. And then you step into actually closing an incision site. So here are some of the examples of um, very, um, various tools that we utilize. Um, so here's an example of, we already showed you that. Um, here's a tying board. Um, and again, I know we're gonna be working with smaller suture when we work with mice and rats, but you have to see how these ties are supposed to go and lay down. And this allows you to do that. And then on the bottom here, you have other uh, instruments or tools that you can utilize. Uh, so the one, for example, on the right here, you have different incisions that you can learn how to, uh, how to close. But one of the challenges that we found that none of that is very similar to the mouse. So the mouse tissues are very thin, especially the skin and even the abdominal wall. Um, so it's very challenging to step it up from these basic tools to kind of more advanced tools. But even though we're still learning a basic procedure like making a, an, an incision. So here, this is a mouse model where we teach how to utilize and how to perform an abdominal incision. Uh, so you have this uh, cartridge uh, here on the animal. And when you flip this over, as you can see here, you have the skin, you have the abdominal wall, and you even have the linea alba. Um, so that's what we're now currently are starting to utilize for this basic training of how to make an incision, but then also how to close that incision. But what's really important uh, that we have to remember is that each one of these tools, you have to be able to identify points of failure. So there's a lot of homemade tools that are out there and some of them are great, some of them are not. Uh, but what's really important, each one of them, you have to be able to identify points of failure. And what do I mean by that? So for example, if I'm making my skin incision here, we wanna make sure that that incision is very smooth, it's not jagged. Um, so if it's jagged, again, that's a point of failure. Um, so that's something that has to be identified with each tool that you end up utilizing for training. So then we go to phase two, which is advanced. So here again, we're talking about gastric bypass procedures. So for us, this phase um, is going to involve end-to-end -end anastomosis and end-to-side anastomosis, which is part of this gastric bypass procedure. So what do we utilize to train on these procedures? So here on the bottom, you have a, a, a two layer intestinal tract, which is very similar. This is actually soft and, and um, it really feels like GI tract or intestinal tissue. And, but this is pretty big. This is about one centimeter in, uh, in diameter. But again, practicing that anastomosis on this, it's, it allows you to see how the sutures are placed, how the tissues come together. Um, and then you have also other tools like here, and again, but these are more single layered uh, uh, tissues. And then you have smaller tools that you can utilize. So this is about uh, two or three millimeters uh, in diameter. Um, and here again, you can just make and perform these anastomoses and practice them. So that's how we put the phases one and two together. So when we implemented this phase, what we also found is looking at the animals that are required for training. And that's a question that comes up very often and we very often don't have a good answer for it. Um, so in this case, what we found that with the conventional or the traditional training, uh, which you can see here, we ended up using about three, on average, 13.5 animals per person. But when we implemented the inanimate training models, it dropped off to about five animals per person. So that's a pretty significant drop. And when, let's say, look at when you're training uh, 50 students, you're gonna end up with 13 animals with the conventional training, that's 60, 650 animals. When you change it to the refined technique, the inanimate models, that number drops to 250 animals, which ends up being 60, almost 62% less animals used. So again, this goes along with the three R's that we all talk about um, and reduces the number of animals that are utilized for training purposes. 
So from this portion, the take home points are that you end up increasing trainees confidence and comfort when you utilize these inanimate models before you step into the live animals and also allows us to use a significantly lower number of animals for training purposes. So is there something that we have not addressed yet? So if you wouldn't mind using the Q&A portion there um, to type in, is there something, and again, I kind of gave the answer away uh, when we talk about that in the first slide, we're gonna be talking about that in the second half. So again, it's not a trick question. That's right. So it's assessment. So why should we bother with assessment? So one of the things for us to remember is that surgery introduces trauma and trauma introduces variables, confounding factors into our studies, which we obviously want to limit or eliminate if we can. So one of the things that with surgery, and again, the more invasive the surgery is, the more of these changes are gonna happen. So catecholamines, cortisol, glucose, cytokines increase. So for example, when we work with the diabetic animals um, and perform these gastric bypass procedures, the glucose levels are gonna be important to us. That's something that we monitor. So if that is gonna be affected by our trauma that we introduce, we have to remember that. So if we can perform the procedure more precisely and more carefully um, and not induce additional inflammation, that's gonna decrease that variable that would increase the glucose, for example, or decrease the glucose. Um, but again, being able to perform these procedures correctly, you have to know the basics, understand the basics. Then we also have, you know, the effects GI motility, immune function, oxygen demand, pulmonary workload, renal workload. And a lot of these factors that you see here, they actually last for about nine days. It takes about nine days for these to normalize. Um, and so it's something to remember because if you're collecting your um, data, your blood or whatever it is um, within that period, your surgery alone is gonna have an effect. It's gonna be a confounding factor here. So, Performing assessment allows us to identify weaknesses as well as strengths of the surgeon, the person that's performing those procedures, and allow us to um, then again improve on these weaknesses. When we improve on those, it allows us to perform correctly the procedure that we're doing, which also leads to standardization. Uh, across the board. So it allows us to compare our data from study to study or from different investigators. And then also allows us to reproduce this information, which is again, very, very important. And I know that some of the procedures you can't standardize because if you're looking for something different, even with the gastric bypass procedures, I think there's 12 or 13 uh, different types of, everyone calls it gastric bypass, but there's some minor differences there. But for example, a procedure like a subcutaneous pump implantation, that procedure can be standardized and it should be standardized. And one of the reasons for that is that within the last few years, we have seen enormous amount of papers coming out and suggesting the animal studies are poor predictors what happens then in clinics. And some of the things that have been identified, why that happens is because experiments are poorly designed, the studies are poorly conducted, and they're poorly analyzed. So if we actually perform the procedures appropriately, the studies are designed correctly and analyzed correctly, they can actually be a right pre pre predictors of what happens um, in, um, and in clinics. So then here we also have, what we're gonna be addressing is the poorly conducted part. So we're gonna talk about training, again, competency assessment, proficiency, 
assessment continuing education. And that's how we can actually improve and make sure uh, that these are uh, performed correctly. So the current practice is assessment of surgeons is utilizing clinical outcomes. So we look at mortality and morbidity. Um, and obviously these observations are very subjective. Um, and we also doesn't allow us to identify the weaknesses and the strengths. And so for example, whenever something happens after surgery, it's always the surgeon that's blamed for that, uh, for, for that outcome. But very often it could be maybe we didn't provide the appropriate uh, perioperative care to that animal. We didn't have the appropriate temperature for that animal. Um, so if we can assess appropriately and objectively the surgeon, we can identify the, where that mistake came. So this type of assessment that we do now in a lot of cases, it's just reactive. So even just a uh, post approval monitoring. Um, so we, when we do that, it doesn't allow us to identify the weaknesses and the strengths. So you wanna get away from the reactive assessment and do proactive assessments. So then of course the question comes up, what is the appropriate assessment? So which assessment to use? And there is enormous amount of assessments out there, but we want to use something that's obviously validated and it can be repeated and that it works. But before we do that, I want to go through some of the definitions. Uh, so we're kind of all are on the same page. So how do we define competency? So it's abilities required to perform surgical procedures to acceptable surgical standards. Then how would you define assessment? And I'll give you a couple 10, 15 seconds to think about it before we move to the next slide. So just think, how would you define assessment? So it's a summative process that collects evidence about the trainee's progress towards a defined goal and involves making judgment whether this goal has been achieved, which obviously that fits quite well here. So then we also have competency and proficiency. And these two terms very often are utilized interchangeably, but they're not, they're very, very different. Um, and I think also in our field, we're starting to pay attention a little bit more to those as well. But competency is really what a surgeon can do and what surgeon has been taught to do. Where proficiency is what a surgeon actually does during a, a procedure. And it can be obviously influenced by technical and non-technical and behavior abilities. So an example is that, for example, someone comes to a surgical training, they're being assessed during it and they're said they're, good, they're competent there. But now when they go into their lab and they work for a week or two weeks and they have 50 or 60 animals that they have to go through, but they're still gonna be utilizing all the skills what they have, which they have learned during the training and during the competency assessment. Um, also, for example, if someone has a death in the family, when they perform surgical procedure the next day, is it gonna have an impact on, on them? And, and it does, it has been shown in human surgery um, that there are actually hospitals that have um, regulations that will not allow surgeons perform surgery, for example, right after a death that happened in a family. But also even things like someone who has a cold, you know, they're tired. That also impacts on their technique. Uh, so those are the things that are gonna as affect your proficiency. So again, going back to which assessment works. And during this period, you know, for the last six or seven years when we have been looking at these different assessment tools, it's pretty frightening that even on the human surgery side, it's really not until late 1980s when the laparoscopic surgical techniques were introduced where objective assessment actually started to develop. And currently, really the laparoscopic surgery is the only one that has validated um, competency assessment tools that work well and are utilized pretty much across the board 
um, in United States and also in Europe. So for us to identify that, we wanted to also do a small study where the objective of that study was to determine the feasibility, validity, and reliability of evaluation tools for competency assessment of the gastric bypass surgery in mice. With the idea that you could utilize the same tools for other ass surgical assessments. My hypothesis was that utilizing objective assessment tools will improve surgical performance faster in comparison to clinical assessment or the traditional assessment that we talked about. So we had 36 participants with no surgical experience. The procedures that they were taught was intestinal anastomosis. You had side-to-side -side anastomosis and side-to-end anastomosis. So the way this process works is that we did assessment before, um, basic procedures, and like we suture techniques and et cetera. Um, and then we perform the training, then assess again, perform the training and assess and move forward. So again, at each assessment with the validated tools, with the tools that I'll show you, you can actually identify the weaknesses and the strengths so you can concentrate on improving those weaknesses. With the clinical or observatory assessment, that becomes very challenging to identify specific things that you should improve upon. So we use the clinical assessment for 18 participants. And then what we also utilize is the objective structure assessment of technical skills. And this is assessment that has been used in a lot of different fields, uh, very commonly is used in nursing and has been validated there for various clinical procedures and also in surgical, surgical setting as well. So we collected video of folks performing these procedures and then we had two blinded uh, microsurgical experts that performed the assessments. So these are the tools that we have, again, translated from the human surgery side to the lab animal slash veterinary side. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have the different portions of the technique where you can identify points of failure. And then on the right-hand side, you have column one, uh, which is when you do it very poorly, but we also describe that when you do it very poorly. And then you have the column on the right, which describes the procedure being done appropriately, correctly. And then you also, in between, you have two and four, which are not described. And again, it's very challenging to get five or six people to agree on one of these descriptive term, terms here, or these paragraphs. So we leave a space in between these uh, that something maybe falls between one and three. And again, so are these ideal perfect tools for assessment? No, they're not. This is something that's a live document that we actually improve um, and adapt over time to the different procedures that we utilize. But it's significantly better than just someone watching, doing clinical assessments for mortality, morbidity, or just someone observing a technique without um, having any of these documents. And one of the challenges also with this, as with assessments, is that with this technique, there's really no argument. It's either you have uh, perform what it says here or you did not. So if someone is performing the assessment of the trainee, if the assessor has a bad day, they could also score that person poorly. And again, that has been shown in human surgery side that it does happen. Or if there's conflict, you know, people don't like each other or, you know, they argue over something. Again, you could have with, an, with the subjective assessments, you can have a lot of uh, gray area here, there. Where with this assessment, that doesn't exist. You get away from that. So here also, you know, we're looking at things like uh, skin incision. They have here abdominal incision, abdominal wall incision. And again, they're described in detail here. Also looking at things like retractor placement, retraction of the gastrointestinal contents. So this assessment is like a cookbook for this procedure. 
So the advantage, again, it's very objective um, and, and identifies the weaknesses and the strengths of that person. And then it also allows the person practice and improve on those weaknesses. But also what it does, it allows the person to walk away from training and practice on their own because now they can go through all of these different steps that are defined here and move forward uh, with, uh, with becoming uh, competent or improving with their procedure. The other advantage of this type of assessments is that the ICOCs love these. Um, you know, you can just demonstrate, this is where I am with my procedure. This is where we have been. So if there's any complications in the procedures with the animals, you can then identify if the surgeon is competent, it's not the actual procedure, but something around the procedure. So with this study, it was pretty clear that incorporating the OSATs allowed the students to obtain a higher assessment score versus when you obtain the clinical, uh, performing the clinical assessment. And those students also with the OSAT assessment improve significantly faster. Again, that's the point um, of, this, uh, of this study. So in summary, here we have demonstrated that the OSATs is a significantly better assessment than a clinical assessment. And OSATs is also an effective teaching tool, an effective competency assessment tool for basic as well as advanced techniques, and it's an effective proficiency assessment tool as well. And I note that I have not shown you data for this, but this is something that we have also done, um, and this tool um, does work quite well. So also when you talk about assessments, there's different things we need to try to incorporate to make things easier. So with the previously, the procedures were recorded, uh, but here, one of the things that we're trying currently is the Google Glass. So if you're not familiar with Google Glass, um, it's something that you wear just like glasses. And on the side here, it, um, it has a camera right here. So you can very easily record, um, and then you can provide feedback, or the student can visualize also how they're doing um, and improve on their technique as well. So again, to me, it's really challenging uh, and shocking that we do provide all of this training for biomethodologies, but when it comes to surgical training, we do not. So obviously the question comes up, why is that? Um, why aren't we doing that? And I think we know the answers to that. One, it's money. It's expensive to have these tools um, and also the personnel, having personnel that is experienced in various surgical procedures and rodents. There's not gonna be one person that knows all of the procedures that are being performed. So it's really challenging to identify folks who have the surgical background and have been taught and know how to perform these procedures correctly. And then all of that includes time. The gastric bypass procedure, you can't learn that within a week. Even within a two week span, it becomes challenging for folks to become competent in that procedure. But we all wanna squeeze that into, you know, learning in one day or two days. It's just does, it really does not work. And also when we're looking at, with the presentations that were here earlier today, you know, with, this, with the new guide, uh, the European uh, regulations, they have now been uh, implemented none of those guide, guidelines and also even the law here, animal welfare um, and law in the United States, they do not allow us to justify for personnel not to be well-trained because of finances uh, or lack of time. So if we want to get away from all of these publications that are coming out that animal studies are poor predictors, we really have to improve the way the techniques are done. Um, and maybe that not every PhD student is gonna be able to do these procedures. Um, you know, either you can outsource, there's a lot of uh, organizations, companies that provide surgical models um, and they have the experience in those models. 
someone performing a procedure, you know, for two weeks, then doing the studies for a year, and then performing again in two weeks just does not work. So unless we can implement those things, I think that we're still going to continue to see these type of publications. And we also have to remember that performing animal research is, a, is really a privilege. And we really have to try to fix things internally. Uh, so make these refinements, uh, implement this training. Because if we don't, it's going to be pushed upon us externally from organizations that are not going to provide us with as much freedom as we have right now. And that's going to be really, really challenging that potentially we could lose the capability of performing animal research or being significantly more restricted here in the United States. Um, as you know, the presentations that were presented early this morning, we know that in UK, there's significantly more restrictions there as also in, in, Europe, in, in, in European Union. So again, if we want to change that, we should try to do that internally before it's being forced upon us from external uh, forces. And this is something that um, I wish I remember who said this, but it is easier to defend an idea than it is to implement it. And this is certainly true with training. We all talk about training. Every conference that we go to, it talks about training, and now it also talks about competency assessment. But we really have to start implementing it. Um, and you know, simple things like uh, the, the, the grants that we receive from, the, from uh, NIH, none of those grants applications actually talk about having money for training. Um, there's some for conferences, for example, going. I think it's like $1,000 or 1500 something like that. It's very limited. Um, so we really have to change our whole field and, and how we think about training and how we can incorporate the training. So the main message from this presentation, I hope uh, that I was able to convince you is that having the appropriate training and assessment allows us to perform procedures correctly, which allows us to standardize and reproduce our research, which in the end is going to increase the ability to translate studies from preclinical studies to clinics. And overall, it's also going to improve the animal welfare and follow with the three R's of reducing the animal's use um, um, as well, again, uh, improving the animal welfare. So at this point, uh, I just again want, would like to thank you uh, for attending this uh, presentation. And I'll be more than happy to take, I think we have some time uh, to take questions um, if there are any. So one of the questions, um, what tools, so let me make sure I have all them. What tools do you use for your phase two training with non-animal models and more complicated complicated types of surgery. There really doesn't seem to be great models for certain types of surgeries. Sister magna cannulations, microdialysis. Also, do you have trainees practice in euthanized animals, which have been euthanized for another reason other than training before moving on to live animals? So the first part, it's definitely true. We do not have a lot of good models um, that are available to us for these more complicated procedures. Uh, but I think starting with the basics um, is a good idea. But then also that's why one of the reasons why we try to develop the model that I just showed you here. And the capabilities to develop these models is there. Um, I mean, so for example, that organization that we work here at Wake Forest, they have a a human model um, that pretty much, you know, when you make an incision, the skin bleeds, uh, the muscles tear, uh, the, if you in, introduce uh, some kind of drug into that person, the heart rate goes up or the respiratory, you know, all those different things, it's feasible, it's there, but we're not willing to pay for that. That's one of the huge challenges that we have to rethink and we have to provide funding uh, for this type of training. And these models are it's feasible to develop these models, 
uh, but we need to provide the finances to be able to purchase and utilize those models. Um, but in the meantime, we can use some of the models from the human surgery side and incorporate them into, um, into, the, la into the lab animal side. And there's various catheterization models that we utilize, for example, uh, for, uh, for, from the human surgery side. Um, and I can also uh, send you some more information about this as well. As regard to euthanized animals, uh, we definitely do utilize those, implement them. Um, and that's when we talk about utilizing animals for training, um, that uh, portions of that, um, I guess when I talk about animals, talk about euthanized as well as uh, recoverable animals. Um, and it's something that's useful, uh, but it's also, the tissues feel very differently. Obviously the tissues don't bleed, uh, so that's a significant challenge, but it's also for some of the procedures, it's a, it's a good step forward. For the gastrointestinal anastomosis, for example, um, I don't think it is. The tissues deteriorate very quickly, so they handle very, very differently um, than live tissues. So for the gastric bypass procedures, we act for training, we actually move from inanimate models straight to um, live animals. So next question, how do you assess proficiency with specific procedure if you don't have access to experienced people to assess the trainee's ability? Um, I mean, that's an excellent question. And this is where, again, for us, we have developed various tools, various assessment forms for all of the procedures that we teach. Um, and they're very similar. So we have two assessment tools. We have a global tool. And again, this is translated from the human surgery side that assesses kind of the general um, skills that you would go from procedure to procedure, like for example, making knots uh, or suture patterns. And then we have the specific uh, assessment tools for each procedure um, described step by step in the way I showed you that example there. Um, but again, if you don't have the person, you can't assess that the person correctly. Um, so it's for a lot of institutions, I know that's a huge, huge challenge uh, because for example, if there's someone you know, wants to do a gastric bypass procedure and there's no one at that institution that has done that um, or has the background in that, you're not gonna be able to assess those folks. Um, so that's something that again, if we ended up as a laboratory animal community pulling a consortium um, that would develop these type of tools together, um, then we would be able to share them through our community and really allow us to improve the way we do research. Uh, but at this point, that is challenging. But if you don't have someone with that background, um, I mean, unfortunately, you can't do that type of assessment. So I'm looking for, I don't see any other questions and make sure I didn't miss anybody. So again, I would like to thank you for attending uh, this presentation. And also I wanna mention um, that if you could go and visit the vendor hall, because uh, again, this conference would not be feasible without the sponsors. Uh, so we would really appreciate if you could do that. Oh, and there's a couple more questions just came in. Um, so one, I am interested in your thoughts on performing assessments during surgery on approved research protocols. Obviously, this has complications for introducing variability to research related to surgical proficiency, but reduces animal use for training. Just make sure I understand the question. I'm interested in your thoughts on performing assessments during surgery. Oh, no. So obviously there are some, like I believe in UK, you can't use animals for training. The animals that you perform the surgical procedures on are already on the studies. And that's a significant challenge. I don't think you can really do that. So give you an example, you know, if you were going into a hospital for a gastric bypass and your options were, and resident who has never performed this procedure is gonna perform a procedure while someone is assessing them on it, or you get an expert performing a procedure. Obviously, at least I hope most of you guys, if not everybody would pick the expert surgeon. Um, 
So again, the person being there, if they're not trained doing those assessments um, in that type of, um, in that, in, in the, 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 the studies, to, uh, to me, it doesn't really make sense because you're gonna introduce a lot of different variables in there. And I understand the whole idea of looking at the number of animals that you utilize, but I think it's been well demonstrated, even with the studies that you have shown that the poorly done studies uh, really do not lead to good results and translation into clinics. That we have spent enormous amount of money and enormous amount of animals that we have used uh, during those times. So again, if we can utilize the animals initially for training and assessment, overall, it's gonna significantly decrease the animals that number of animals that we utilize. Uh, because again, you decrease the variables, you decrease the number of animals that you need for a study to get the right uh, data and statistics. So where do you get the inanimate models? Um, so there's different um, companies that provide them and I can uh, provide that information uh, to the folks that are attending this specific presentation. We can email them to you after the conference. Uh, but the mouse model that I demonstrated, that's something that um, we have to develop internally because there's just nothing uh, like that out there. So I don't see any more questions. So again, thank you so much. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the conference um, and enjoy the rest of the day with the presentations. And also I hope you come back next tomorrow uh, for a whole bunch of, of really cool and worthwhile presentations. Thank you so much.